So there are four different masculine archetypes and they all have their unique strengths and potential weaknesses. So let's dive in and figure out which one your man is or your dad is or your brother is, or of course, if you're a man watching this, which one you are. Hey friends, welcome back. If you're new around here, my name is Jills and I talk about things like feminine energy, self-improvement and wellness for women. So if that's something you're into, you should absolutely subscribe and stick around. So I did a video a little over a month ago all about the feminine archetypes and that was a hit. It was super popular and a lot of you wanted me to do a video on the masculine archetypes, a complimentary video to that. So here we are. So there are four different masculine archetypes. There's the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. And these archetypes were originally brought to life by Carl Jung, but many people have studied them since, including Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. They wrote the book called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And so if you're looking for a book on this topic, this is a great one, I highly recommend. And of course I will link it below. And that is where a lot of this information comes from. So all of these masculine archetypes are within a man to some extent, but usually there's like one or two that he'll really resonate with. And he'll also usually embrace certain archetypes during different periods of his life as well. And so although part of the reason for this video is that it's just fun to understand a man's dominant masculine archetype, but it can also be a super powerful way for a man to tap into the different parts of himself and become a more well-rounded, powerful person. So in today's video, I'm going to share the characteristics of each archetype when a man is in the healthy version of that archetype, as well as what each archetype might look like in their shadow, so their potential weaknesses, or more specifically, what negative attributes might show themselves when they are out of balance. I'm also going to provide some examples from pop culture media because I feel like it really helps you to understand these archetypes at a deeper level and picture them. And then lastly, I'm going to share what each man can do to embody more of a specific archetype. So for example, if they want to embody more of the king archetype or the warrior archetype. So let's dive on into it. The first masculine archetype is the king and the king and the warrior are the most like stereotypical typically traditionally masculine archetypes. But the king, not surprisingly, is a great leader and one of his strengths is his ability to be calm, centered, and grounded and provide a sense of peace, structure, and stability even in times of chaos. He focuses on reasonableness and rationality and is very emotionally stable. The king is secure in himself and that is the biggest differentiator between a healthy king and a shadow king. A healthy king wants to lead to help others, to guide others, and even to sacrifice for others when needed. A healthy king King is also supportive and nurturing, but in a firm and clear way, and is the voice of calm and reassurance. A king is powerful and decisive, but more than anything, he focuses on stability, structure, order, peace, security, supporting and leading others. He may also have a strong desire to leave a legacy, whether that means having children or building an important business or just impacting the world greatly in some way. Now, if a man is in his shadow king though, and is out of balance, then he may be controlling, you know, just shouting orders at people. And he will be very ego focused, meaning he wants to be the king, not necessarily necessarily to help others, but because then he's the king, he's powerful, he's special, he's important, he's in control. And a man who embraces the shadow side of the king is likely very insecure. And so he'll be pushing other people down just so he can stay on top. Because at his core, an unhealthy king or a shadow king is really just a scared little boy. He will feel threatened by other powerful people. So instead of helping to guide others or help others, he will attempt to squash them. He wants people to see him as important and he will do anything to maintain that position and that authority, even if it means putting down others. Or because he does usually feel so insecure, he might go in the complete opposite direction and be super passive, resist any sort of responsibility, just hand over power and control. Or he might fluctuate between these two, you know, be really oppressive and controlling when he has the chance and then be weak and paranoid in other situations. So let's think about a husband and father and use that as an example to see the differences between a healthy king and a shadow king. A healthy king will take his role as husband and father quite seriously and he will make sure he provides security, grounded energy, stability, order when needed, leadership, decisive action, love and support to his people, meaning his family. An unhealthy king will order his wife and kids around. When you question anything he says or does, he will be filled with rage instead of trying to seek understanding. He may even put down others in his family or squash 
slash or minimize his children's achievements, especially if they are little boys, because secretly he feels threatened by them, or more specifically, threatened by how powerful they may become in the future when they grow up. A healthy king leads with his heart, and an unhealthy king tries to control with his ego. Now, some examples of the healthy king in media would be Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. Eventually, when he chose to embrace his role as leader, he led with his heart. He was courageous, loyal, willing to sacrifice for his people. He listened to advice, but still made his own decisions. Also, Ned Stark and his son, Rob Stark, they were both very much kings. I am a king. A shadow king from Game of Thrones, though, would definitely be Joffrey Baratheon. He was just a tyrant and was very abusive. I am the king. King Leonidas from the movie 300. He was not perfect, but he does definitely embody lots of that king energy. He said he was willing to die for his men. He took the queen's input seriously and valued it, and he took his role as leader seriously. Also, this might seem like a silly example, but Mufasa in Lion King, a wonderful example of the healthy king archetype, while his brother Scar was a great example of the unhealthy version of the king. But in a more realistic sense, Jay Pritchett from Modern Family, Chris Gardner from The Pursuit of Happiness, and also Philip Banks from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, they all generally embody more of the king. Winston Churchill, you can see his king energy through his leadership in World War II. George Washington probably embodied more of that king energy as well. Now, some things that men can do to embody more of this king energy is take on leadership positions, take on more responsibility. He should try to positively impact others in some way, whether it's his family or his community. And he should focus on his mental and emotional health because remember, the king has emotional stability and that is really important for his success and his ability to be a good leader. And he should also just focus on being able to be grounded and calm and make clear decisions and take decisive action when needed. They also need to make sure they focus on building up a sense of self-worth and security if needed, because a man's insecurity is often what leads to the king's downfall. Next is the warrior, and the warrior is pure energy and force. He is alert, dynamic, focused, and the authors use the term aggressive to describe him, but not in the traditional dangerous way that you would think of the word, but more as in a sense that he will quickly initiate with force and power when needed. The warrior knows how to focus. He has a clear mind and he can be very strategic and tactile. And another thing that the authors say about the warrior, and I love the way that they word it, they say that he is always awake. He is never sleeping through life. He is very aware of his own strengths and skill sets, but also aware of where he might be lacking. So he is able to process in his mind, like, okay, realistically, what am I capable of and where are my limitations? One of the defining aspects of the warrior though is that they are very aware that death is imminent. He is very aware that life is short and it can be taken from him like that. And that inspires him to live every day to the fullest. And so everything he does matters. Warriors are quick thinkers, quick to take action, but they don't like to exert energy when it's not needed. They don't do things just for the sake of it. You know, they don't do things for drama or to look cool or anything like that they do something because there is a clear purpose. So this man is resilient, courageous, possibly a little bit fearless, possibly a little bit of a minimalist as well, and usually quite self-disciplined. This is the type of man who really resonates with the statement, no pain, no gain, and he has a sense of duty. Now, sometimes warriors will struggle with the emotional side of life, like he can be emotionally distant. He has almost a detached way of viewing things and living life, and sometimes that can be beneficial for him, and in other situations, it won't. And it's actually very important important for any man who really resonates with the warrior archetype to make sure he harnesses some of the other archetypes as well, just to be a bit more well-balanced. So although we don't see this archetype played out in the traditional way as often anymore, you know, like as a warrior, as a fighter, we can see this in more modern times as the entrepreneur who is really driven and focused in his career. He is always thinking about next steps. Everything he does is intentional. His business is his clear main focus, and he might even be a little bit of a workaholic. Or this is the man who is super disciplined in his physical fitness or his schedule, and he's always kind of pushing himself for more and more, not necessarily to be highly regarded, but more so that he can be a strong force on the world. But if a warrior is in his shadow, that can be destructive and potentially quite cruel. Because he is such a strong energetic force, 
that can do a lot of good, but it can also do a lot of harm if that energy isn't used in the right way. They may develop a compulsive personality and almost do things to too much of an extreme because what drives a warrior in his shadow is anxiety, meaning that a shadow warrior will continually push and push himself and go nonstop because that underlying anxiety is almost forcing him to. And not surprisingly, this can lead to burnout. And so a man in his shadow warrior can either be way too intense or cruel, or he can go the complete opposite direction and that anxiety can manifest in him basically just being a pushover, letting others walk all over him. A perfect example of the shadow warrior expressed in both its forms is from the movie, Nobody. It's a really good movie. It's one of my husband's favorite movies, but it is very gory, I will say that. But Bob Odenkirk plays this man who definitely has very strong warrior energy. But in the movie, he switches from one shadow to the other. He starts off being this total pushover and kind of just like a wet blanket almost. And then something big happens that makes everything switch. And he becomes so intense, so cruel, and he pretty much just goes on a rampage. Another example of the shadow warrior archetype are Nazis. You know, obviously that was an intense kind of cruel and I'm sure not all of the men were warrior archetypes, but they were trained to be shadow warriors. They were trained to detach from their emotions and their empathy. And the authors mentioned in this book that the Nazis would actually train their soldiers by giving them a puppy to bond with and take care of and build this relationship with, and then they'd be ordered to kill them. So they were trained to completely detach from this emotional side of themselves and to become those shadow warriors. And so we can see how this shadow warrior energy was incredibly violent and hurtful to the world. Also Darth Vader, he was a warrior archetype, but definitely more of that shadow warrior archetype. I am your father. So the warriors are the most suppressed archetype because of how destructive they can be and because many people are afraid of them, especially women, because a lot of us have suffered or had really bad experiences because of a man being in his shadow warrior. But the thing to remember is that the warrior archetype will always be a part of men to some extent, whether we allow them to express it or not. And if we don't encourage them to express it in healthy and productive ways and take responsibility for their actions, it will likely come out in destruction destructive ways. But anyway, some examples of the healthy warrior are Thor. I love Thor. He is a warrior at his core for sure, but he is well balanced in other areas too. I will protect Asgard and all the realms. Luke Skywalker, he seemed to be a bit more of a well-rounded warrior as well. Grey Worm in Game of Thrones, he's so dedicated and focused. But warriors don't have to be fighting all the time. They can also be activists or politicians, you know, somehow fighting for a change. Some warriors in real life would be Jason Statham. He definitely has that sort of attitude, as well as Jason Momoa, I think, and David Goggins as well. He's a former Navy SEAL and is super intense. He's an ultra endurance athlete. And now he teaches other people about perseverance and discipline. And he's a super famous author now on these topics. Now, if a man wants to get more in touch with his warrior energy, Energy, he needs to get active. He needs to go do something with his body. He needs to go to the gym or take a boxing class, or he needs to stand behind something that he really cares about and fight for it. It's not enough that he just reads books and watches movies on warriors. He needs to get up and do. He needs to take action. He needs to focus on living each day to the fullest and taking advantage of every second he has and being more disciplined in his life. All of these things will help him tremendously. The next archetype is the magician and the magician is the knower. He's kind of like the wise one. He is the one who understands knowledge to a deeper level. And in more ancient times, the magician could have been the shaman, you know, who knew things that other people didn't or the wise elder who understood the deeper depths of life and passed that on to the younger men or the younger generations. Or this could have been the man who was more of the advisor to the king. But this can also be, especially in today's world, the master of technology. But the magician is a man who really prioritizes and focuses on that deeper knowledge that not everyone is familiar with. So this could be shamans and healers, yes, but this could also be doctors and lawyers, engineers, mathematicians, psychologists, inventors, entrepreneurs, especially in the technology space. Anything with information above the norm. The magician is the thinker. He is great with 
his mind and he can put things together in his mind that not everyone can. He is reflective and he's likely to be more introverted as well. And so these magicians use their knowledge to benefit others or help others, or they try to impact the world in some way with that knowledge. He compassionately wants to use that knowledge or that technology that he understands and others don't to better the world around him. Now, some examples of a magician in media would be Tyrion in Game of Thrones. He was smart. He always kind of ended up in that advisor to the king kind of role. He was always kind of guiding others or helping others. Give him something by giving him nothing. Dumbledore from Harry Potter, you know, he's the wise elder. Also Rafiki in Lion King, he's the wise monkey that helps Simba along his journey. Look hard. Doctor Strange definitely has that magician energy as well. But in real life, this would be somebody like Elon Musk, very smart man, an inventor at heart, always learning something new and trying to use it to impact the world. Or Steve Jobs, he was well known in the technology space for his new inventions and knowledge. And there's also Nikola Tesla. Or this could be someone like Tony Robbins. He is regarded in the life coaching space as someone who kind of understands life to a deeper level and tries to teach others. Or on the complete opposite spectrum, there's Tyler Henry. He's a famous medium and whether you believe it or not, doesn't matter, but he apparently has this knowledge or knowing or gift that others don't. But if a man is in his unhealthy or shadow magician energy, then yes, he is probably still highly intelligent. But instead of using that to help others or guide others or teach others, sometimes people use it in a way to manipulate others or control others or just to be greedy. Basically, he knows information that others don't. And so he's gonna keep that information to himself for his own benefit. And unfortunately, we see this a lot today because we are in the age of technology. So for example, hackers. Obviously, they are very intelligent people, but they use that knowledge to hurt others, to harm others, and purely just to benefit themselves. Or this could be the man who refuses to share knowledge because he likes the superiority that it gives him. So the shadow magician energy, they intentionally withhold information to obtain power or material wealth. Now remember that the magician archetype is really focused on the mind. So the shadow magician can sometimes get stuck in their head. They can think too much. This can be the man who just thinks and thinks all day, but never takes action. Or the magician in a shadow can be the type of man who is too passive. He doesn't actually put in the work and the effort to learn the knowledge that he's craving so much or to become a master in a certain realm. He's just not putting the energy and the effort into things. He's not taking responsibility for that. And so basically he wants all the glory of being a magician, but without any of the work or the effort of the responsibility. And he hates to see other men succeed because he is bitter about it because he wants that, but he's not willing to put in the effort and the action. And so when he sees that, it triggers him. Now, if a man wants to embrace more of the magician archetype, he should learn, he should study, he should take on new knowledge, he should teach or guide others in ways that he is already an expert. Since the magician gives to the world through their knowledge and intellect, you have to become knowledgeable about something. So you have to start there. And then once he feels like he can make a difference with that knowledge, then he can do that. But there is a reason why so many of the magicians in media or in real life are older because sometimes knowledge takes time. And last but not least is the lover. The lover is passionate. He feels alive through his senses. And in general, he has heightened sensitivity to the things people, energy that's around him. The lover is the most sensual of all the masculine archetypes and he's able to feel compassionately and empathetically. And he can just truly feel the world around him and he wants to experience the world around him. So for this man, physical touch is usually quite important. He's probably more intuitive than not. And he's probably also pretty good at reading people too. He can also be pretty sensitive to shifts in his environment. So for example, if someone in the room gets in a bad mood, he can probably feel that in his body. And because he generally feels more deeply than the other archetypes, that means that he may feel things like love, happiness, joy at a very high level. But in that same regard, he can also feel things like grief, suffering, loneliness, anger, 
at a high level as well. You can't feel one without feeling the other. And of course, this is not always the case, but the lover is likely to be someone like an artist, musician, writer, actor, something more in the creative realm, or he may just live his life in a more unconventional way. He does not have to have a creative profession, but if not, he probably will add some small spice of creativity to his work in some way. He likely really loves the finer things in life, like food or wine or craft cocktails or cigars, or maybe he collects art Art, or maybe he's super into classic cars, but the lover can love deeply and they can truly care unlike anyone else. Now, of course, because of the nature of this archetype, it tends to be strongest when a man is really focusing on his love life. And many younger men are ruled by the lover archetype as well. But if a man is out of balance and embraces more of the shadow of this archetype, then he can become addicted. He can become addicted to things like food, alcohol, TV shows, he can become addicted to things that make him feel good. But as we all know, just because something feels good, it doesn't mean we should necessarily do more of it or be doing it at all. This can be the man who is literally obsessed with cars and irresponsibly spends all of his money on them. And unfortunately, a man in his shadow lover can be easily pulled off course and thrown off center. And instead of being a leader in his own life and taking control of his own destiny, he tends to get swept up and controlled by life itself. His sensitivity can absolutely be a strength, but in the shadow lover, it will cripple him and it will leave him so ungrounded and unbalanced. And he can start to feel lost and a victim to his life and his circumstances. And he can also start to get lost in his own feelings. Like sometimes he can struggle to look at things objectively and separate his feelings from reality. But in general, the shadow lover has this underlying feeling of lostness. And that is what leads to a lot of his struggles. So while this can include all the things that I just mentioned, he can also feel eternally restless. Like he is always searching for something to complete his life, but he never really finds what he's looking for. And he doesn't even really know what he's looking for in the first place. Or finally, this lostness can cause him to not feel at all. It can cause him to shut everything down and there's no more energy or vitality in his life. And not surprisingly, this can lead to depression. Like other archetypes, the shadow lover may oscillate between these two sides. So in some moments, he may feel very intensely. He might feel controlled by them and almost have these addiction qualities, right? But then in other moments, he may feel nothing and be depressed. Now, some examples of the lover in media are Jack from Titanic, a prime example of a younger lover who's kind of enamored with a woman and her beauty and that romantic experience. Also, Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, he has a gentle side to him, an intuitive side. He's able to be vulnerable when needed. He's in touch with his heart. The lover can be an excellent leader and Aragorn shows that. What does your heart tell you? Also, Jack in A Star is Born is another example. Some examples of the lover in real life, I would guess Johnny Depp for sure. Not sure if it's the healthy lover or the shadow lover, probably a little bit of both, but I think he's definitely the lover. Also, I would guess Drake. I think a lot of male musicians are lovers, honestly, as well as Ryan Gosling, probably Matthew McConaughey. They seem like lovers. An example of the shadow lover would be Jay Gatsby. He is a dreamer and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but he's unable to accept reality and he's just enamored with Daisy. He's addicted to the idea of her though, not the actual reality of her. Now, if a man wants to embrace more of the lover archetype, then he needs to let himself feel. He needs to let himself love. He needs to let himself experience things. That's all important. But at the end of the day, remember that there should also be boundaries with this. He can take time to appreciate the finer things in life. He can be more present. He can activate his senses. He can try to woo his partner in some way and show her how much he cares. He can take up a creative activity or hobby or just get outside in nature to disconnect from the intensity of the world and connect back to himself and his intuition. These will all be super helpful. Now comment down below and let me know what is the dominant masculine archetype of your partner or your dad or whoever the most important men in your life are. I know for me, my husband is definitely a mix between the king and the lover for sure. But just to wrap things up and to give you a super simple takeaway, the king is the one who leads, the warrior is the one who acts, the magician is the one who thinks, and the lover is the one who feels. And so as you can see, every man to some extent needs all four of these archetypes to be a well-rounded, successful, mature, masculine man. And so in this book, the authors talk about how a man shouldn't ask himself if any of these shadow qualities show up in his life. They should ask himself how these shadow qualities show up in his life, basically implying that 
all men to some extent struggle with some of these shadow aspects and it's important they bring awareness to them so they can grow and evolve from them. Now, I also have a video all about the feminine archetypes. So if you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend you go check it out. You can figure out your dominant feminine archetype and there is a quiz in that one too. It's special, so go check it out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you got value out of this video and found it interesting. I will see you next time. Bye.